yeah. just so I that we have. I think it would be better in, uh, uh, to go into that uh, being right here at the salt, because very few people were here at the time of the salt air hurricane. But I would like you to tell me first uh, when you came down and what salt air looked like when you first came down. Well, you see, my husband had been here since 1917, but I came here in 1932, which is wh quite a bit later. Mm -hmm. And what was salt air like then? Was there a general well, store? Well, it was, uh, yes, it was always a general store, but, um, and it was owned by uh, Jean Veronese's grandfather and he had the store here and um, that was the only store and the Yacht Club of course was in existence. In the same place? In the same place and in addition to that on that opposite uh, from Broadway to Neptune they had what we call the casino and at one time that was a restaurant, uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, they used to um, have concessions. People would come in and cater there. But in those days of the Yacht Club, they used to have nothing. It was like Newport, where you have all these rocking chairs on all four sides of the room. And everybody would sit in those rocking chairs and rock back and forth and dress to the teeth. White, beautiful dresses. Uh, of course, I'm shocked even today when I see bare feet in there. But um, dress beautifully and the men dress beautifully. With pies? Oh, of course. My Suits? Dear. Long? Yes, long dresses, and it was, even gloves in some instances, but it was this uh, rocking chair brigade, like, uh, just like Newport. Did they uh, socialize or play bridge? Or? Uh, individually, in houses, yes. There were quite a few people here who were excellent bridge players, and uh, my husband was one of those, and uh, he refused ever to let me play a game because some of these people played for high stakes. <laughs> and uh, they were, uh, and I, you know, couldn't care less. So uh, I used to embarrass him very, very much by just not playing, you know, a good game. But there were some experts around here, and that was one of the things they did quite a bit of. Well, was there sort of a, a, a big league that you had to get into? Or no, was it no, a friendly, no. Uh, it, but it was smaller, of course, and it was uh, easier to know people. Mm -hmm. And, of course, in those days, there was not the renting that there is today or the new people coming in. And it was more or less a very staid village. Did the... Uh, Yacht Club served meals? No. No, it was just no. a social club. Yes, bar. that's all. Uh -huh. That's all. Uh, did the... Uh, uh, were there parties at individual houses? Yes, but not as it was today, uh, as it is today. It was... Um, it, it was... Uh, people were much more conservative than they are today. We were much more concerned. Did the, um, and that, when you first came down in 1932, was there, there were houses beyond Ocean Promenade? Oh, yes, surely. There used to be a beautiful walk along the ocean there and beautiful houses. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the houses that went in that terrible storm uh, was owned by a woman who lost her life in that, uh, was a Madame Bazinet mm -hmm. who uh, lost her life in that storm. Well, and I Miss Alice was a relative of hers and she luckily was found uh, hanging off some kind of a telegraph pole that had capsized or something of the sort. How did you happen to be out here that day? Well, because we, people didn't go. We were preparing to go back to uh, the Middle East. 
and uh, we were here packing up and our trunks were open and we were ready to clear out and get get away and um, it began to rain very very heavily and my husband was very upset because he looked out the window and he said there goes my beautiful pine tree he was so upset because his pine tree he loved and so he said let's put on wet clothes and go and he timed it to see the equinox at top of the head or the beginning of the equinox you know the storm at its peak whatever and so i'll never forget i had my hair up and you remember tin curlers i had tin curlers all over my head and we had big rubber boots on i had a cocker spaniel and he wanted to see the storm at its height so we walked up pacific war and his sight was very poor he had um, glaucoma and cataract so he never admitted he couldn't see but he his sight was so poor and he wouldn't wear glasses so we're walking up and suddenly I see the Catholic Church turn around. A big tidal wave came and took the Catholic Church and and turned it around and it was gone. So I said to John, there goes the Catholic Church. He said, it's just like you. You're always imagining things. And with that I looked down and the water was coming up through the boardwalk. So I said, I'm going to run back home. So I had my dog and he had to follow me, of course. So we came back inside the house and the water was up to, you know, to the decks all around. And John said, that's so strange. There was such a lull. It's like death. You, you don't, you can't imagine what it's like. You hear absolutely nothing because we were right in the eye and this was the eye. So he said, I'll walk down to the bay and I'll see what, it, you know, what happened. So he walked down to the bay and I went with him. And he, the Eladio was our little boat and they were dragging the few people on the Eladio and they grabbed John and said you have to get on the boat he said I'm not gonna get on any boat and with that I started running back here because I I left everything open all the doors the windows and everything and the wide open so he had to follow me oh in the meantime I had met a woman by the name Suarez, Mrs. Suarez, and she had what is now the Conley, Stanley Conley house. And she said, oh, she said, my house is gone and that's, excuse me, that's all we own. We don't have anything else but that house and it's gone. Well, you know, this was hard to believe because it struck over on that side first. So, I said, well, you can come to our house, you know, very big of me. So by the time I got back here, then the hurricane came on the other side. See, it makes a circle. I hit one side of the town first, then it hit this side. So John said to me, you've got to get out of this house because if that chimney falls on us, it will kill us both. So I had just we had just come back from Paris and I had a beautiful hat made, I'll never forget it. Black hat with a green tassel on it and a beautiful green and black suit, newly bred. So I put the suit over my own. The hat I couldn't get on with the antennas I had on my head. And I had a steel box, don't ask me what was in it, but that seemed to be my prized possession. And the dog, and John said, you've got to jump. Well, jump, there were no boardwalks by that time. And I was scared out of my wits. 
So we were in the back of the house and he said, I gotta push you, you gotta go. So he had a great big heavy coat on because we had these winter togs on. So with the exception of my dressing, I'm gonna be saved, I'm gonna look right, you know. Two minutes I lost hat. <laughs> Dog was gone, box was gone, suit was gone. And I didn't know where I was. I could not breathe. That you, were, you were in water then. In water. The, south, the, ocean, the ocean met the bay. And I could not breathe. I couldn't intake because the wind was so strong. I, was, I thought I was going to suffocate. So John jumped out after me. And he tried to pull me, you know, by the nap of the neck because you couldn't. Not that I could swim. I could swim very little. But he was trying to keep me up. And I kept pleading, don't let me go, let me go, because if I'm going to die, I'm not going to, you know, struggle through all this, you know. So he still held me, and he said, I will try to find something floating, because through the air we're going, ice boxes and oak, uh, you know, big oak tables and uh, roofs and... Uh, Oh, you can't imagine where everything was torn to pieces and it was floating around like uh, matchsticks. So he found a section of the boardwalk that had, you know, all the boardwalks disconnected. And he pushed me on one piece of board and he said, you lie flat on the, you know, not to get... And he, he tried to get up, but he had these big rubber boots on and this big heavy coat. And he was hanging by his fingers. I couldn't help him, you know, because the wind was so terrible. And it was just a miracle that he ever got on board that piece of wrap because I thought he was gone. And this lasted to my memory about three hours. Uh, uh, and then they reported us missing because in those days you knew everybody who was on the island and they could not find us. So they had us reported missing. Where had you floated? We, of course, didn't know where we were going because we had no idea of space or time or anything else. We finally ended up in what is now the LeMay house and uh, John got to the back of it somehow and notwithstanding how it was it was tricky things aren't quite normal you know some like the Schmidt house I can't remember why that was damaged every house was damaged but uh, I can't remember why that was badly damaged but anyway that old LeMay house stood up and um, we tried to get in the screen door was full of mice where they were hanging on to save themselves it was and i'm scared to death of mice <laughs> so here are all these mice clinging on the back of that screen door and we went up got up that stairs somehow what was sloshing in water and got up to the second floor and um, I got down on my knees and boy did I pray because I thought, you know, this house will go next, you know, and we'll be in it. But we, this was dangerous because of the fireplace. And um, so uh, finally, um, they located us. You didn't come out of the house. You just oh, stayed there. No, we stayed. At the, at, when it subsided, it subsided like that was weird it was weird and we just stayed there you know you're in a state of shock and there was no place to go there were no walks the houses were all torn to pieces and so we were there and suddenly one of the workmen were out looking and they found us and they carried me to the town hall town hall where the town hall stood up and in there were the few people who had survived. And the story, of course, the bay was full of houses. And that Eladio, well, I'm trying to think of the actor's name, who 
now on who did own what was then what is now the Kaplan House, and uh, he was uh, a very excitable man, and he was on the Eladio with a few of the people they they could get aboard that and. What saved the Eladio were all these houses coming on top of it. But they thought they were going, you know, the boat was going to sink. But the roofs of the houses and all this sort of protected it, you know, like as a canopy. And so they finally got those people out of the Eladio into the town hall. And that was in the days of Pathé News. And Pathé News could not get over here because the bay was full of houses. And no boatman would risk the trip, the trip ahead. And it was hours before they got over here and brought us water and brought us food. And um, was this the uh, Coast Guard that finally got through that brought you water and food? No, it was uh, the film people, the news people. The Coast Guard, I don't know where they were. I can't remember them being around. I'm sure they were, but uh, not what obviously. What time of day did this all begin, this whole uh, It uh, was September 21st, and it's, I would say it started about, uh, oh, just before 1 o'clock. And didn't you hear any warnings? No, because we never knew when it, this was a new happening here. My husband didn't believe you know that anything like this could happen and he'd been here for quite a few years before me you knew there was a storm but you didn't yes uh... but we always sat it out and i've sat out everyone since in spite of that awful experience we've never never left during a, a storm now there are alerts but those times years there were no alerts no alerts and there was no way, I guess, that the Coast Guard, even if they did know, could communicate with the superintendent. Oh, at that time, I can't remember, I think it was Charlie Rich. Uh -huh. But and it so was a then, terrible experience. How long did you wait in the village uh, hall before you... We were there for over a day. And then um, a lot of people were taken off. And uh, I don't know what happened to all of them, but uh, I know, um, I can't remember more than that, only, you see, we were lucky here. This house went off the post only and moved. But we were lucky because we were here and all the windows and doors were open so that the wind had no resistance nor the water, which really saved us. Mm -hmm. Because that, most of the houses were all closed up because came Labor Day and no one stayed down here one minute after that. That ended the season. Finished. Had you left the windows and doors open on purpose or no, was it just a, no. you were just in the house? And we were in the house and we uh, wanted air mm -hmm. and uh, it was uh, just a miracle we happen to have um, uh, taken that, that chance, but uh, it was uh, an experience that is unforgettable. Uh, a very good friend of my husband's, and I think, I'm trying to remember what his name is, and I can't, he was a fabulous photographer and he lived in what is now the uh, Wineland House on Navy and he took marvelous pictures of the hurricane. This was um, off limits uh, because of looters and uh, they had all sorts of police guarding everything here because it was wide open. And I can remember my husband saying, well, if anybody gives me $50 for the house, they can have it. What made him change his mind? Well, we were ready to leave. We didn't, he didn't change his mind at all. We were ready to go abroad where we were for two years. 
so finally, uh, we always came back for a holiday, you know. So John said, well, let's go back and see what that awful saw there looks like. Well, if it hadn't been for Paul Schmidt, this place would not be on the map at all today. But he was then the mayor, and he had connections with the WPA, and they told us that he brought down hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of men who needed the work, who demolished those houses that could not be put back. They had to be destroyed, like this woman who called me today. Her house was destroyed and was finished. But so yeah, many we were destroyed. But um, if a house had to be put back in shape, or it would be torn down. And uh, when we got off the boat, we could not believe what this man had done. I, I tell you, Saul so owns their life today to Paul Schmidt. Well, now, your house was off the It was off post the post. And turned slightly, right? Yes. Now, how did it get back on the post? Did well, there was a man by the name of Drake who was doing all the rebuilding and putting back what he could. And you commissioned him to put your house oh, well, back on the post. Oh, it had to be, yes, surely. But uh, you didn't really think that uh, there was any point in it. No, uh -huh. pointless. But I tell you, it, uh, it was an unbelievable experience. And uh, it's uh, one I don't want to go through again. And yet, when I get these uh, notices of certain storms, it doesn't seem to alarm me because I th they said it ha happens once every hundred years. So I think I've that had my hundred year experience. Lightning and hurricanes don't strike twice. Oh, no, yes, they do, though, <laughs> unfortunately. So I better beware. <laughs> well, did the, um, uh, did the village... Uh, come right back or well that I don't know you see because we were completely out of touch for you because uh, his interests like you know vanished it's just there uh, but he said that's the end and that was the end and we didn't connect with anybody and uh, that's why it was such a surprise to come back what was Paul Schmidt's connection with the WPA well was he it? was a very influential man very influential man and a very fine man. He was an attorney. And uh, the village, as they say, the village owns their existence today to that one man. Uh, when you first came down here, how did you, uh, you came out from Manhattan, how did you uh, come Well, out? I grew up on uh, in, in Deal on the Jersey coast. So I'm, I was used to, to uh, I didn't grow up there, I summered there. But, uh, you know, the beach to me was something I loved. And uh, although I couldn't sit on a beach, and I can't today, uh, because of my skin. And uh, it, uh, it was unique. I couldn't believe when I saw those little wagons. I thought that was, when I heard the name of Sole, I thought, what a name to give a town. That sounds awful. Too corny. <laughs> Very corny. And I still feel so. But anyway, it's growing on me, and now I don't even recognize it as being odd. I think it's great. What about the inconvenience? How did you uh, cope well, with you that? Well, you sort of you know? live with it. You know, we had, in those days, it was, you know, you lived without the things that we now so used to. Did you have electricity when you first came down? No. What no, did you... No. Uh, I can't remember when that went in, but it went... I can't remember exactly the date that, that they put electricity over here, but telephones came much later. Much later. Because I still have the fixtures for the gas here in the house. You had gas lights? We had gas lights and only. And uh, cooking by with gas. Gas. And uh, oh, kerosene. Our stove was kerosene. And uh, they had some kind of a municipal arrangement up where the present reservoir is that uh, supplied the gas. 
and the, the gas came in that way. It came in through pipes. Yeah. So we had, uh, that's just the way we had And it. how did you supply the kerosene? Well, we used to buy a drum. I still have the drum out in the back. We used to buy it by a big drum. And go out and uh, heat by electricity. We all had these little kerosene lamps. And not only kerosene lamps, but kerosene heaters and kerosene stoves. But we all have them. But it was easier because you couldn't go and buy five cents worth of kerosene in that day. Those days, you, we all had these big drums. And our drum is still out And there. who delivered those? They came from the main. Uh, they I came guess. over on the boat. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. I think it was Frank Brothers, as I remember. Then they were big uh, oil dealers, and they, I believe, they're still in existence. And then, how did they get to the house? Well, uh, that was delivered, I believe, by the workmen. Mm -hmm. By the workmen, and of course, there were only, as I remember, only two in those days, other than the superintendent. So that was a village service. Then. Yes. I mean, you probably right. paid for it, but it was the yes, village that Yes, yes, of course. And how about uh, food? What, well, it was that Lang, Lang was the name of the uh, people who had the store. And uh, you got your, or you would go over to the mainland if there were things that he didn't have. Mm -hmm. And uh, you never had, at one time, I think you did have grave what is now, I guess, the liquor store to a concessionaire it was a butcher shop. And um, it didn't last because, you know, it, it was hard to refrigerate because when we first were here, you know, we only, all, all we had were ice boxes, you know, and the ice would come in. By the time it was delivered, there wasn't much left. But we had the old-fashioned ice box. Um, was uh, Captain Patterson running the boats when uh, you uh, Captain came? Patterson was originally the one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not that, his father. Mm -hmm. Not um, himself, but his father. And his father also did the renting view. And that was way back. Mm -hmm. Was he the only one then who was uh, yeah. in, in real estate? Yeah, well, real estate was not real estate as we know it today. It was very few people would lower themselves, I guess, to rent the house. Because uh, even when we owned all that property back in Fair Harbor, which is a, a few years back, I look back on some of my notes where I was getting uh, uh, for a season 400 three-bedroom house, fireplace, huge house. Mm -hmm. And uh, so rents were so nominal, but of course that kind of money in those days was a lot further than it is today. But it wasn't a big business then coming Oh, it was no business. Time. It wasn't really a business. Today it's a business. Right. Well, how did you happen to choose Pacific Walk to build your house? Well, I didn't. You see, our original house was nine, the, the one next to the Episcopal Church, mm -hmm. the Hill House. And uh, then my husband decided that was too large. And he had this property over here, I guess, for some time. So he said, well, might as well put a smaller house, one story, on Pacific Walk. And that's how it came to be over here. Were there many houses over here then? Not many, no. Ludlow's was, but Ludlow was not the owner then. Ludlow, mm -hmm. to us, is new. And uh, uh, that was a dear friend of my husband's. I can't remember his name, but uh, that was here. There weren't many houses, and even the Levinson house had been moved in from the mainland fairly to us recently. After you? After, after your oh, yes. After, oh, yes, quite a bit afterward. 
So you were pretty isolated over here, didn't you? Yes, but uh, it was such a, a different life that it, it never seemed like isolation, you know. Did everybody still use the bicycle? Not like they do today. Now everybody is bicycle-minded, but I can't even remember that there weren't that many around. People walked. Yes. It was just a yeah, that's right. A more leisurely And you place. see, really, beyond Pacific Wharf was the utilities. You see, that was not, it was sold air, but so one only went from Pacific Wharf to West Wharf. You see, that was a limited town. See, it's only since Fair Harbor discovered our services here that they built up mm -hmm. in that section. That's right, the East Village didn't the East. Really yeah. come into being until... No, and, until they discovered what they could get over here. Um, well, who built this house? Did oh, Mike of course, Coffee? Mike. Of course, mm -hmm. that great love. Mike, he built the original house, Mike. Uh, he, he built the original houses here. Uh -huh. How many houses do you imagine that he built? Oh, I can't remember. You should ask Ann Keegan. Uh -huh. She was practically born here. Did he have a certain uh, number of houses? I noticed that there are some houses that are very similar. Did he have well, he had, plans yeah, to well, I, from, I, I think his plans were in his head. How did you arrange to have a house built by him? Did you? Uh, well, it was no didn't great have an deal. Architect. No, just let Mike do it. And Mike would lay it out, and uh, there it was. Anything he did was to us perfect. He was a phenomenal man, unbelievable. Unbelievable. No, no uh, quarrels about his workmanship. No, or, because you know, it was always perfect. What if you wanted something different? Was he amenable? Not very, you know, because he was dyed in the wool on his idea. And uh, I can remember we wanted to, when we came back from the other side, we were caught in the war. We came back, and I had to bring a lot of things back. A lot of things, of course, I haven't, and they're still there. But uh, I wanted to have my attic expanded so I could put heavy trunks and whatnot up there. And John said to Mike, now I have to have that attic open. Mike said, what do you need that for? You don't need it at all. Do you think he'd build it? No, because he didn't think we needed it. So we had to get somebody else, and then Mike felt very badly that he hadn't done it, you see. Because, and I always regret it, because if Mike had done it, it would have been perfectly done. But um, if he didn't think it was right, he wouldn't do it. So <laughs> he had his own way of doing things, and everybody let him have his way. How many, uh, how long did it take for him to... Uh, oh, well, a year is nothing. You'd these were whole... well-built, these are well-built houses. So it would take a whole year? Oh, him? well, because there were a lot of times in the year that you couldn't work. Right. You know, but so his work was perfect. He would uh, start a house in the fall, say? Yes. And then would it be ready in June? I mean, he would work well, through the Well, there window. was no timing, Mike. Mm -hmm. You know, you couldn't time him. You were glad when he did it. And you let him take his time. Now there's a house next, very close to me. I will not say where. And we came down one weekend. Wasn't in existence. Next weekend, we came down. It was a three-bedroom house. And it's not a prefab. How many, did Mike have people working with him? He had a couple, yes. Charlie Rich used to help him. And I don't know who else he had. And of course he had, I think Henry was always around. I remember Henry was forever. And um, 
Henry was a handyman. We could do, oh God bless Henry. He used to do so many things for us that nobody. Today somebody called me from Fair Harbor, but he only wanted a screen put in. Do you think I could get anybody to put a child put their foot through a screen? Do you think I could get anybody to put that to redo that screen? I'm they telling you, it's, it, it's not to be believed. Wait, wait, well, yeah. did Mike do the wiring plumbing? Uh, it, yes, the plumbing. He used to turn off all the houses here. Five dollars. Turn them off and turn them on. Uh -huh. And did he put the wiring in too? With the, uh, or did he call in I an electrician? I don't think he did that. When that came so much later, I think there was a man around from the main, from the mainland. See, when this house was built, that was built for electricity, so he didn't have that to cope with. He just had his uh, plumbing to think of, and he could plumb all over. That's why most of us in our houses today, the hot water in most houses is it yours on the other side? You know why? On the I, right. I only discovered that when I went to Ireland, because that's the way it is in Ireland. And he caught us all on that. Even the other day, I could say, my, my cold water is awfully warm. For God. That that's the way he... It, and I didn't know why. And... Um, you never asked, you never asked him like why. When I went to Ireland, I discovered that that's why. That in Ireland, that's the way they set up the hot water. So we carried it over here. Well, I always noticed uh, that a lot of the bathrooms open onto the living room in salt air. Is that a, a my coffee trademark? Not especially, I wouldn't think. Because I can think of about four houses that are older, including ours. Well, right, but yeah. uh, uh, no, now in, in, uh, our, in the, the house next to the to Protestant church, it doesn't. See, the bathroom is upstairs, and uh, downstairs was the maid's bedroom. In those days, everybody had that maid's bedroom and bath, but it was not, it was off the kitchen. I guess uh, everybody had a maid everybody. and a maid's room. I oh, guess it was, uh, oh, definitely. If it was, you couldn't exist without that. But you know, today a maid. Who wants to be a maid, my God? Although it's a very, ex you know, a very high-paying job today. I'm telling you, but who can afford it? Um. Children's programs like they have today, and you know that makes for that. And I guess there were not enough houses or enough children around to uh, make a big thing about it. But um, Joshua Heifetz has been here. Did he run? He ran for a it. season. Or? For a season. And, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sure there are many others. I can't recall them all. I remember Robert Mosey's daughter lived here for yes, a while. Yes, I sold the house to, um, to Brainerd. That's the Brainerd house today. The was the old Robert Mosey's house. On Surf? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he used to come out. Come in all the time. He lives around the corner from us. Still on in that Gracie Square section. Okay. Yeah. And he's still plotting to do oh, his Oh, he's road. too much. I'm telling you. He never gives up. He never gives up. Um, Great guy. And he gives to have his. Uh, uh, I remember the story about the involving him in the hurricane. He used to uh, sleep in a houseboat in the back on the cove here. And uh, you know, he used to sell fish. And everybody used to walk over there to buy their fish. 
and uh, he never put his money in a brownie, but he put it in mason jar. So came the hurricane, and of course the uh, the boat just disappeared and ended up somewhere or other. And when he went to find his money, of course the boat had kept solid and everything, and he couldn't find his money in all those mason jars. He was a crippled man, and he was an old favorite here for years, but he lived in a little dinky houseboat, and then on the cove there, nobody ever bothered him. And did he sell fish from the houseboat? Yes, boat, or did from the houseboat. So you would have to go yes, down? Yes, you'd go there and get what he would have at the time. But um, he, I don't know whatever happened to him after the hurricane. That ended his career here because where he went. But he was a very old man, very old man. But uh, my husband remembers the time when they used to have uh, the, the, this was really rum running country when they used to drop off the ships used to drop the loads off here on the ocean front and drag them across the island to the mainland. I can't tell you much about that. You, know you mean they that. were smuggled? They were smuggled. Yeah, foreign. Foreign, surely. Liquor, and then it was surely. surely. Um, that was, uh, uh, it was another man. I can't think of his name. Also, who was, uh, he was around for a long time over there on the cove, and kind of a little dinky houseboat, who was uh, involved in that uh, sort of thing, you know, helping get the shipments from, and it would be dropped off from the big boats. They'd be rowed in, I guess, to the shoreline here and then trotted across and would be put up on the other side. But he knew more about that than me. Now, during the war, you were here in Lebanon? No, I was there. I was caught in the war over in Lebanon, and uh, my husband and I were the last two people to get out who were Americans on the world ship. And we came through, we came through the, across the Mediterranean, and we came into the port of Naples when it was all, they put those bombs down. Mine. It was mine. It was a minefield. And uh, everybody had drills. They were sleeping on the floors, and uh, there were no accommodations for all the people getting up. Not from that particular port, because there were very few Americans over there at that time. Very few. Um, and, uh, but they were picking up people, you know, at the many stopovers. But it was. Uh, uh, we lived for a time we were there during the war when there were nothing but blackouts. Yeah, it was impossible to live. Were you here during a uh, 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 day, for example? That was in August. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember that. Um, yeah, it was. I am trying to remember. I remember. What year was that like? Forty-five. Uh-huh. I, I remember because at that time I was with the Portuguese diplomatic service. And I remember that very well because uh, right after that well, the importance of Portugal sort of descended because the only way you could get anything to Europe was to get a special license from the Portuguese government to have it go through their territory and on. And uh, so that's where, what I was doing when I came back. You were working. When did you start doing real estate out here? Uh, 
for a baby and don't bother me. And it was very strange. And I thought that was a lot of fun. You know? So I started to work the houses myself. And then a few people in Solay said, oh, wow, you keep uh, getting people for your houses. Can't you help me out? And I said, well, surely if I can help them, I'll send them over to you. And one day my attorney said to me, what are you doing? I said, nothing. You know, I'm managing those houses John gave me. And he said, you can't send other people to rent when you don't have a license. And I said, what license? So he said, you have to go through the mill and get a broker's license. So I took the test and did all that. And there was a woman here who was one of the original old family, Sam A. Van Buckland. And she was, she lived in what is now, her original house was lost in the hurricane. And then she ended up by getting the house that uh, Marvin Schwartz had. And she was a very dear old very close friend of John, excuse me, so she was, she went into the real estate business. Well, I would not do anything to hurt anybody, especially her. So I had my broker's license, but I never did anything with it. Here, I stopped sending people because my attorney told me to. I just handled my own business. Excuse me. Hello? You asked me when I started the real estate business. It's only after she died in, in respect for her because I would not uh, interfere with, uh, with her business. So, since you started, though, there's been a big change in uh, the real estate practice, hasn't there? Not, there shouldn't be, but I, apparently there is. No, but I mean, you know, from the time when people didn't rent. Uh, now there's many more people renting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's too bad, a lot of people say, you know, because they like the owners to remain here, but... Uh, the economy is such, it's uh, necessary to pay the taxes and whatnot. The, um, what about postal service? When you first came, I how did you get I can't remember. The yes, I do remember. Where the doctor's office now is was a rack, an uh, open rack, and letters were pulled put in there and you'd go through and try and see if there was a, would be a letter for you. And nobody had charge of it? Or no, no, it was, no. Open? It was an open rack. What, what if it rained? Oh, I meant uh, inside, oh, inside that building. And it was an open rack, you know, pigeonholes. Mm -hmm. And we used to look and uh, because there was no way of knowing where they'd stick it. The workmen used to bring it across from the mainland and just stick it in there and you'd go there and look. But not often because those days there was not that much mail anyway. Mm -hmm. But it was open and um, just within what is now, I guess, the waiting room in that doctor's office. Um. How many uh, boats were there running? Mm -hmm. Very few. The Eladio was the, the old one. And that was it. See, we used to own our own boats. It was not a concession of one shot. The village owned the boats. The village owned the boats. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's only fairly recently, really, that it's a concession.
Is there a change? Uh, what kind of a change do you see from, your, for example, point of wood still owns its own board, Right. Uh, well, it's, uh, you know, I hear complaints now that the boats don't meet the trains. I don't know because I have my car. And, uh, but I hear a lot of people say, I, if I leave on that boat, there's no train. And so there's no attempt to uh, make it convenient for those people without cars to make the trains that they need to make. Mm -hmm. I hear that very, very often. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are many more trips now because there are many more people here. Even when we first came down, there was really only one boat a day you at 420. Yeah, that's it. What a change, and that's not so long ago. Was there a doctor in, uh, in no. the village? No. What no. happened during emergency? Well, I guess you just uh, get a special boat. We always could get special boats. You get a special boat and go to a hospital for help. There was a doctor living here, oh, but he was not on duty. And that's the old house that belonged. Oh, I'm dating myself with all these old houses. But anyway, I happen to know. Uh, the lion's house belonged to a Dr. Clay. And I know my mother came down here, and she had cancer. And. Uh, in 1935. So that tells you how long ago he was in the living here at that time. And I, he, she had a hemorrhage. And John went over and Dr. Clay came to her only as a courtesy. You know, he was not obliged to. But, you know, this is a small village then and everybody knew everybody else. But Dr. Corey was uh, the, uh, the one doctor that I can remember. What do you think is the biggest change physically in the village? The From the houses now. For instance, this woman, Mrs. Weeks, relative, called me up and said, don't tell me there are modern houses over in Soleil. I can't bear it. And I said, well, you'll have to bear it. There aren't many, but there are some. And uh, see, these old timers don't want this village to, they want the charm that apparently Pornwood still has. They don't have these monstrously big modern houses up there but here we have a few but not many but i said you'll be surprised there are some here but she was a little bit disappointed she wanted this fellow not to change mayor benson stood at a village meeting the first village meeting i ever went to he said we would all like saw there to stay the same as the day we first yes. saw it right and i think that's how, true. how true that it is because it's so it's so <coughs> different but even as far as he's concerned it's different because he's bought more land and he's changed his house and the, this didn't remain the same and for us his was a surprise when we saw that go up because we thought we could this we can't play you know uh, it is the most delightful and charming house in the world when you get in it. But it was so new to us to have a house on stilts that hard, one floor, uh, and so modern. You know, what didn't seem like so there, but now it blends. Because of all the trees, the trees have grown up. It now looks like it's flowing well, from the trees. They worked so hard on that garden made them sad deserves so much credit because they have a beautiful, beautiful surroundings there. That landscape is terrific. 
but they work. Do you think people are uh, need more services <laughs> than they used oh, to? Yes, indeed. You know why? They come to me because a house without a dishwasher, they can't believe it exists. Dryers is a must. What? No television? Is there a stereo in the house? Now you can see they used to all these in, in, in town. They come down here and they expect that they're going to find the same thing. I try to tell them, you know, that we're a summer resort and this is more or less primitive living. And um, I also try to tell them that electricity is very expensive. And um, they all object to the high price of electricity, but they want the services, you know. But uh, many houses don't have, many houses only have a washing machine today. And I don't even have black. I have the first GE automatic that was sent over here. And do you know I couldn't stay in those cycles? They Did call make your house shake? Sure. <laughs> Did it shake? Did I shake? My teeth shook. And everything else I couldn't stop with it. Drove me up the side wall and I gave it away. Now I put the in the tubs. They my call if you put those old fashioned tubs in where you have one slide that you can slip washing in and the other side for the dishes. So I just put stuff in there and, you know, whatever I have is not that, not dirty. It's just soiled and it all comes out. I'm not hanging on a line without a dryer or a washing machine. I went through it. Oh, I have two of those. It is a must because all day long I listen to the news. Drive everybody nuts. The radio is on the news. I'm, I'm news mad because I, it's my life I have to worry about. So I have the television on mostly to the news. The radio on only to the news. Uh, WCBF constantly. Uh, People in the old days had many. Yeah, but no. they they require the the automatic. Yeah. They, uh, yes, that's right. Because they can't afford them anymore. They raise uh, very few people. Only half of them. You know they're expensive to make, and you know they, it's so all the employment. You know social. And uh, who's what? I don't know. Very few people can afford it. And what they want, you know, today you have vacuums and sweepers and things. We didn't have real days, we had booms. Um, so this makes life much easier. Did they have tennis courts when you first came down I here? believe they that they might have been on. But China's was not in. And you know, I some in some cases I can't rent a house because I can't get into the tennis club. How about 
the bay? What kind of activities were there going on in the bay? Sailing? Was Occasional people with a rowboat. Excuse me, or a sailboat. Was uh, the rowboats? Yes, they were around, but sailing was not the, the. You know, there wasn't that much of that I can remember. My husband used to come down here in the winter stuck country, and that used to be a big thing here. And. Um, did he come down for the day? No, they used to stay, stay over. Uh, they, uh, I'm trying to think of of um, Kitty Doggins' farm. Had a big house on the ocean front, and they would either stay there or. There was a man, the old Shea house was owned by a man by the name of Christensen. And he was another one. And they had boats. And they would come across in their boat and go dunk hunting. And uh, I don't know how long they stayed, you know. But they used to go out on those blinds and freeze to death, you know, shoot ducks. Uh, what, was there swimming in the bay? No, that was not what you like today, no. No swimming area. No, it was, no, that was a new, relatively new. It, uh, occasionally people go off the main dock, but that's the new dock since the original dock. And uh, there was no area at all to swim from. But. Uh, how about ocean bathing? Was it very popular or was it? No, well, because there weren't enough people around. You know, it was very limited in the... And it was not that uh, outdoorsy uh, feeling that everybody has today. In those days, people, you know, were not fanatics for the sun. But today, they have to cook themselves to death. And there's also more of a trend towards uh, active sports. Yes, but uh, there was not the, the, the fields that you see today. They were non, non-existent. And of course, the, the camp for the children was not existing. And um, so it was, it was not active today. Uh, today, I could hardly hear my, I had to close this door to hear the, um, and I blame Dick Starkey for that, because I couldn't hear on the telephone with the screaming, because they've got that uh, playground right on top of my house. And not only that, I have to mention this, because uh, I discovered now, they right in front of my door, they made a path into that, uh, playground there and I don't know what to do to close it off because they drop their bikes in front of my house and people come in and uh, not only that but uh, they should not go through those trees it's, you know I'm trying to hold those trees but I wish they'd plant a few more trees there to keep those really it would absorb some of the noise In May, uh, in the end of May in 1936, my uh, 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 husband's son had gone all his life to Portsmouth Priory, where he was at the time and was within two weeks of graduating, and uh, was taken seriously ill, and there was no means of communication to us here. because 